nine years in the making. Sony has dropped the new FE 70 to 200 millimeter F4 macro G OSS two lens, introducing performance upgrades and autofocus, stabilization, magnification, and sharpness, while also somehow reducing its size and weight, optimized for events such as sports, portraiture, macro, and now video. Now, the biggest change to the optical design of this lens is the introduction of a floating focusing element, enabling the lens to have 0.5x magnification, so half macro magnification, shrinking the minimum focus distance to 10.2 inches at 70 millimeter from 3.3 feet on the original version of this lens. This new lens also has significantly improved corner-to-corner -corner sharpness and resolving power, making the use of teleconverters possible without noticeable loss in detail. This lens also features a spherical, advanced a spherical, super extra low dispersion and extra low dispersion elements to help reduce chromatic and spherical aberrations. This lens also has the latest and greatest Nano AR coatings version two, which helps control flare and ghosting. It also features a nine blade aperture diaphragm for a really nice bouquet rendering. So as far as improved autofocus goes, most notable is its faster video optimized autofocus system featuring four XD linear focus motors, two for each of the lenses focus groups. This boils down to 20% faster autofocus for still image shooting and about 50% improved on tracking moving subjects. Plus, they also significantly improved focus tracking while zooming, which you can imagine being difficult for a camera and lens to do. However, this lens is parafocal, so when you zoom, the focus doesn't change. It stays focused on what you're like locked in on. The new autofocus system also works with the flagship Sony A1 blackout free 30 frames per second high speed continuous shooting, which is double the frame rate of the original lens. In addition to that, the new autofocus system has near silent operation and autofocus breathing has been significantly reduced, as you can see here. Very little focus breathing, wow. The full-time direct manual focus option is really cool. There's a dedicated switch on the side of the lens for this, and, it, and it's a feature that makes it super easy to quickly adjust using the focus ring while in autofocus modes, and the linear response manual focus system makes manual focusing very easy and natural feeling when you turn the focus ring. Feels really good too. Stabilization has been upgraded by offering a new mode known as option three. Sony claims it compensates for camera shake to minimize framing disturbances. This helps to keep up with fast and irregularly moving subjects for photography, such as sports and smoother video footage when tracking. Here's a quick handheld test filming my daughter Layla for reference, just like a static hand holding test. I got steady shot enabled, of course, on, and I'm using mode three on the lens this time, the new mode. Hi, Layla. All right, there's 200 millimeter. So guys, when it comes to teleconverters, this lens is compatible. And because this lens is so sharp, you don't really have any noticeable loss in image quality. I mean, there is gonna be some, but it's so hard to tell because this lens is so sharp. So the 2.0, the 2X teleconverter, makes this lens into a one-to-one -one macro at all focal lengths. While the 1.4X teleconverter, which I have here, will give you a 0.7X macro at all focal lengths. In other words, you gain effective focal length and you lose some light when using teleconverters. For reference, the 1.4X teleconverter will provide an effective focal length of 98 millimeter all the way to 280 
at f5.6 aperture. And the 2.0 teleconverter will give you an effect of 140 to 400 millimeter at f8. Now, just to go over some of the key specs, this is now an f4 to f22 lens. For APS-C mode, you're looking at 105 to 300 millimeter. It's got a 0.5x magnification across the entire zoom range. Minimum focus distance, 10 and a quarter at 70 millimeter. It's about 16 and a half inches at 200 millimeter. It holds focus when zooming because it's a parofocal lens, which is awesome. It's 15% shorter and lighter than its predecessor. It has a detachable lens collar ring, as you can see here, which is awesome if you want to shoot in vertical format and then go back to landscape while on a tripod, just as an example. It's really cool. It's got the Nano AR2 coatings I already talked about. It's got the fluorine lens coating on the front of the lens to protect it from like, you know, oil and dust and stuff like that. It's also a dust and moisture resistant design. Has a 72 millimeter filter thread and this beast weighs in at 1.7 pounds or 794 grams which is about 0.1 pounds lighter than the previous model. Now, this beast goes for about $1,700 US, so it is significantly more expensive than the previous model. All right, guys, so I just want to show you what this looks like compared to the original lens. Now, you can see them stacked up here next to each other, and looking at the original lens on the left, you could see how much bigger it is than the new lens, as far as the, the height goes. Now, when you extend the new lens, it's actually larger than the old lens. And now, just looking at this lens a little closer, if I take the lens hood off, you can see here that the old lens hood does not have a pedal design. This is the old lens hood. This is the new lens hood. So the new lens hood has a pedal design. The old one has like this like rubber lip on it. And looking at the lens here, this is what we got. And it's got a nice pinch style lens cap there. And there is the front lens element. Again, this is a 72 millimeter filter thread. And when you zoom the lens, you can see this one grows here. And then looking at the original right here, this lens, the zoom is all internal, which is pretty nice. Don't get me wrong. And the focus ring feels really good on both lenses. Oh yeah, definitely feels good. Now you also have the zoom lock right here. So you can lock the zoom down if you want. And you can see the scribed here for the focal range all the way to 200 and so forth. Now looking at the side here, we have the autofocus manual focus switch, full-time DMF for direct manual focus. So when you're in autofocus mode, when you have the focus locked, like if you're shooting a flower or something and you have the focus locked, you could then, while holding the focus button down, you can fine tune it with the focus ring and it will like live adjust for you, which is just awesome. And then when you push the shutter button the rest of the way, it'll take the shot at whatever you adjusted the focus to. So you can basically use autofocus to get it really close to what you want and if you need to fine tune it you can just touch this with your finger and fine tune it that little bit very very easy to use and it was awesome when I was doing those macro shots of those bugs you saw a minute ago. I'll show you another one right now. In addition to that here, we have the focus range limiter here. So you can limit it to macro work if you wanna do that, or you can have it in the middle here if you're shooting through a fence at like three meters, or you can just have it full. So the whole focus range from infinity all the way to the minimum focus distance will work there. Now, optical stabilization you have right here. You have on and off, and then you have three modes. So mode one will compensate for normal camera shake. Mode two compensates for camera shake when panning moving subjects. So if you're like going left to right and you're like tracking moving subjects, dirt bikes, cars, somebody running, mode two is where you're at. Now mode three compensates for camera shake to minimize framing disturbances. This helps you to keep up with fast and irregularly moving subjects for photography such as sports and for smoother video footage when tracking. In addition to that, we have three focus hold buttons here and you can program you know, the focus hold button to whatever you want. By default, it's focus hold, and they are all programmed for focus hold. You can't individually program them. Now, looking at the back of the lens here, you can see we have a really nice uh, all metal here lens bayonet, and there's a rubber gasket. Nice weather sealing there. And of course, this lens collar comes off if you wanna take it off as well. You just unscrew it like so, and then you actually pull the little knob out like the knob actually pulls out. And when you pull it out, that will release it and you can just take it off like that. I'm just gonna put that back on. Now, when you have the lens fully exhumed like this, there is no focus creep. So it's not, you know, going down on its own. So out of the gate, that's what you can expect. Same thing when you're holding it upside down, it's not creeping at all. So that's pretty nice. Let's throw the lens hood on here. 
And that's what it looks like with the lens hood. Let's zoom it out. See, it's a pretty sweet looking lens. Now I used this mostly on the Sony a7 IV, but I also used it on the a6700. All right, guys, let me show you some sample photos. You saw a couple in the beginning, but I wanna go over some lab testing photos and I wanna zoom in on the photos so you can see them like really close at like one to one. And uh, then we'll wrap this up. So looking at the lab scene here now, this is just at 70 millimeter and I took a couple of different shots. I just wanted to show you how sharp this lens is corner to corner at 70 millimeter. Now these are raw photos and again, just incredible image quality coming off of this lens in my opinion. Now that's wide open at 70 millimeter. If I look at the dollar bill, you can see just how insanely crisp this is. Now, if we stop it down to f5.6, you can see the bokeh balls change a little bit. And now zoomed in, we're at 100 millimeter. And again, I'll just zoom in so you can see the insane sharpness here. It's unbelievable. Corner to corner, really, really good. Stop down to f5.6, you can see here. And here's at 135 millimeter. Again, we'll just zoom in so you can see the detail. And notice there's like zero fringing. Now here, stop down to f5.6 again. Here's 200 millimeter at f4. And again, in the corner, you can see the detail is very, very good. Now f5.6, just stop down a little bit. So this is about as close as I can get at 70 millimeter. And if you zoom in, you can see just how insanely sharp this is at f4. Now that is just absolutely remarkable if you ask me. Now, if we go across here, we got f5.6, and let me just zoom in here, you can see it tacks up a little bit, but it's really, really sharp at f4, so it's honestly not as noticeable as you might expect. Again, here's f4, so you can see it's not that much of a difference. Now if we stop down, you can see the bokeh balls changing, and of course the background rendering changing. Here's f16, here's f22. Now, here's that 200 millimeter at the minimum focus distance. And if we zoom in, again, F4, you can see just how incredibly sharp this is. And if we go across, I stop down to F5.6 here. And now we're looking at the teleconverter. So I have the 1.4X teleconverter. And if you notice up here on the top left, it's actually giving me the effective focal length of 98 millimeter. So I have the lens at 70 millimeter, but with the teleconverter, it's actually acting like 98. and this allows you to get that much closer to the subject. And you can see here, there's like no loss in sharpness, no noticeable loss in sharpness, which is remarkable uh, in my opinion. I did use the teleconverter years ago on the original 70 to 200 millimeter F2 lens, and it was the two times teleconverter, and I definitely noticed a loss in sharpness when I used that teleconverter. So the 1.4 teleconverter is definitely sharper than the 2.0 teleconverter. Now here, stop down to f6.3. Oh, also notice the aperture, the max aperture is now f5.6 because we lose a stop of light when using the teleconverter. So now here's f8, here's f7, and now we're at 280 millimeters. So this is 200 millimeter, but again, the effective focal range is 280 with the teleconverter. So this is what we're looking at. And you can see with that telephoto compression how the bokeh balls are really popping now. So if I zoom in here, just so you can see the detail, it's really, really good. Now I apologize, I, I forgot to adjust the ISO here. So this is at ISO 25,000, um, but it still actually looks really good. You can see it's kind of noisy here. Here, here we go. This is at F6.3, let's look at this one. Now here's F5.6, again, exceptionally sharp. Here's F32, so the max aperture instead of F22 is now F32, again, because of the teleconverter. And you can see there's a decent amount of like octagoning here when you have it all the way stopped down like that. And now I move the camera back a little bit because I just wanted to show how the larger light in the background in my bedroom renders perfectly round. And you can see the bokeh ball rendering. It does have like a little bit of an octagoning here and there's also a shot of the sun that I have that I'll show you in a minute where you can see it but the quarter looks exceptionally good and on this bokeh ball it looks really close to perfectly round. Now here's another one here this is at 280 f5.6 and just stopping down f6.3 f7.1 f8 and here's another one at maximum magnification f5.6. So this is at 0.7x. This is as close as I could possibly get to the quarter. And this is 100%. This isn't cropped or anything. This is the full frame 
say this is how much magnification you can expect to get if shooting like a quarter as an example. All right, so don't forget on the top left is the EXIF data if you're curious what the lens was set to, what I had camera set to. Now, looking at the fence here, you can just see the fence fall off shot and you can kind of see the background just melting away uh, into what I like to call butter. All right, so here's a picture of the sun and at 200 millimeters. So what I did was I put it in manual focus and I defocused a little bit to get this shot. And when you defocus looking at the sun, you can actually, the, it like grows, like the, the sun will actually grow and you can get a really cool shot like this. But you can notice there is just a slight amount of like octagoning visible here that I was surprised to see. You can see it again in this shot here, that just that little bit of octagoning. And this one as well, you could, this is just very, very slightly out of focus. You could see it just a little bit, but not too bad. So I just wanted to show you that. Now looking at the hummingbird in the garden here, just looking down, you can see how that background renders. Now this shot, I focused on the beak and then zoomed in to 200 millimeter. This is how much magnification you can get, it's incredible. Now here's a picture of Ollie the cat. Now zoomed in, just look at that incredible sharpness. I'm super impressed with that. Now here's another one. This was taken with the A6700, by the way, and zoomed in, just look at that unbelievable sharpness and clarity. This was taken at F4 too. This wasn't like at F8 or F5.6, F4, wide open, incredible sharpness. And here's just one of my uh, dirt bike like handlebar protector. Now I wanted to show you this because I took this handheld at 200 millimeter at 1 25th of a second. So that's a really slow shutter speed for hand holding at 200 millimeter. So that's with the sensor stabilization and the optical stabilization. You can get sharp shots like this at 1 25th of a second. You know, I have a pretty steady hand. So now here's just a shot of a duck I'm not sure what kind of duck this is, but I kind of startled him when I when I showed up there. And uh, I was pretty happy with that shot. This is one of those cases where I wish I had the teleconverter on so I was able to get a little bit closer. But anyways, the reason why I went over to the water was because I wanted to get this lotus flower shot. So this is looking down at the lotus flower. Now here's another one. And here's another one. And you can see that nice depth of field fall off looking pretty creamy. Now here's just a cattail. And if you zoom in again, just you could see the insane sharpness and background butter separation here is really good. Now I was walking down on Elm Street. Now this shot here, you can see I was at 200 millimeter. And if you zoom in, just look at the sharpness of this flower. I mean, that is just remarkable. Super impressed with this shot and this lens, how sharp this renders and the background butter. It just, it really, looks amazing. This is a very, very good optical lens. Now here's just a quick 200 millimeter versus 70 millimeter shot. So this is 70 to 200 from the same location. Snapshot. Oh, I took a couple of sports shots here. This was, uh, I was just in rapid fire mode and these two people were riding their bicycles away from me at a decent speed, probably like 10 miles an hour. And I just started firing away. And you can see here, every single shot is sharp. Now, I would expect this lens to be able to track very high speed moving subjects and maintain sharpness for every single frame if using it on a modern camera, especially something like the A9, the A1, the A7 IV, the A6700, for example, um, which is what I was using in that shot. Here's just another flower image, a couple more here. Just trying to show you that background rendering and depth of field play you can get. Here's one where there was a bee on the flower here. Now this one unfortunately is out of focus, but the bee was actually flying in front of me. I was so hoping that this shot was sharp. I didn't really have a fast enough shutter to, to freeze that bee, but the depth of field was off anyways, but it would have been a really cool shot. Here's just another one. Now I got this chicken Philly cheesesteak the other day at Up and Smoke Food Truck, and it had like, you know, fried cheese and stuff. Oh man, it was killer. Really, really good. And here's just a wider view. This guy gives you like a pound and a half of, of a, like product on the on the hoagie. Uh, it doesn't matter what you get. It's like so much meat. You kind of need to just eat it with a fork. It just is what it is, you know? Here's the up and smoke. He's actually parked in Middletown, New York, by the way, over by Route 6. It's another image of that sculpture. And you can see it's just like balancing there, which is really cool. Now walking along, this building was being lit by the sun and uh, I thought it was a pretty decent snapshot. Just thought it looked kind of cool old architecture. 
I was actually over in like Beacon, New York, right by the Hudson River. And this was looking like across the river at this like mansion on the top of this hill. Just look at this. I mean, how incredible is this place? So nice. So we went on this boat tour and this was the captain. And tell me this guy doesn't look like the captain of a boat. He has like, he is, if you saw this guy walking down the road, you'd be like, that's a captain. You, you could just tell. This particular shot I thought was really good uh, for a portrait, you know? So on the boat here, this was just in the water. Apparently this is like an, uh, what's the name of this bird? It's some kind of hawk, like an osprey maybe, an osprey. So again, the teleconverter would have been nice for a little extra reach, but I didn't have it on the boat. Here's some old factory just in the distance. Oh, these guys were flying on jet skis. Check this out, this guy wrecked. Right here, you could see he went sideways. See that, he's like losing it. And right here, he's, he gets thrown off the machine. You see his feet? He was fine. Uh, he got right back on, it was no big deal. But anyway, here's just another one of this cool old boat at a distance and we're like on the water now. And this was a lot of fun. There was a barge coming past and uh, it was just cool. I love these boats, these big boats, they're huge. And it had a tugboat pushing it. So there's the tugboat, it was actually pushing the barge. Now these guys were flying on this, uh, you know, speedboat here, cruise control. Now here's just a cool image of the Bear Mountain Bridge. I tried to include the sun and the people in front of me to give you like an idea of what to expect. You know, I was trying to show like the surroundings and stuff in this particular frame. And here's a bridge shot. So you can see the Bear Mountain Bridge from this angle. It's kind of where the boat turned around. Here's just another vertical. And here's another image. I like this one, the way it's lit by the sun looks pretty cool. And here's just another one. We're actually on our way back now. So this is looking towards the bridge, uh, heading back towards the dock. Now this, for some reason, this mountain here, I, I saw like faces in the rocks here. Do you guys see any faces? There's like almost like an eye and a lip, something else. I don't know. I pointed at it and multiple people like saw it. They're like, oh yeah, I see it. Anyways, let me know in the comments below if you see faces. <laughs> so anyways, here's just a little pano and just really like the layering and the depth of field of the colors and stuff in this particular frame. And here's a picture of the boat that we actually took. So it does, it looks really small, but it was actually a little bit bigger than it looks. Now to get an idea of what you can do with the macro, let me just zoom in here so you can see this. Look at this shot. That's really, really good quality guys on like a mosquito type bug. So you could imagine how small that bug was. Incredible. Here's one of a bee. And the bee actually had like pollen stuck to its like sides here. Like it was almost like building a sack of pollen or something. I never saw that before. I never noticed it before on a bee. Here's just another one. And you can see this bug over here. That's this bug right here. Now just look at this. I mean, incredible detail, right? Here's another one. If, you, if I zoom in on it, you can see just how awesome that looks. And here's just another angle here. Really impressed with the quality there. Now, this was just some kind of beetle. He was like walking along. The ISO was really high. This is ISO 10,000. He was moving pretty quick. Now, I took a couple of quick snapshots of Layla, and this one I slightly edited. I just brightened her eyes a little bit to bring in some of the catch light into her eyes. So again, background rendering looks fantastic. This lens has really good 3D pop. All right, guys, so for $1,700, is this lens worth it? In my opinion, yes, it is. The fact that it has the macro ability is like a game changer because the, the smaller size and form factor and less weight were all huge positives. The addition to the mode three on the image stabilization is really nice. The direct manual focus switch, I really like that as well. Favorite thing about this lens is you could pretty much use it for like any kind of event type photography. I'm thinking like weddings, uh, sports, anything like that. And now you can use teleconverters on it, which is awesome. But the macro ability is so cool. So now you can just go right in and do macro photography as well. So if you're like at a wedding, for example, and you need to take ring shots, you don't have to carry another lens with you. It just like eliminated having to have the macro lens. This is definitely good enough for close up photography when it comes to that stuff. It's not true one to one magnification, but it's really good. 0.5x is awesome. And when you have a high resolution camera or a reasonable resolution camera, you can crop in a little bit if you need to. And like I was saying earlier with the one point, 
4x teleconverter that I have right here, you can get 0.7x magnification, and the 2x teleconverter will give you true one-to-one -one magnification. Although the aperture, you do lose, you know, some light. You lose a stop of light with this 1.4, and you lose two stops of light with the two times teleconverter. So, but yeah, $1,700. It's not exactly cheap. This lens definitely costs some money, but like I said, the optical quality is absolutely stellar. The sharpness is off the charts. It's one of the sharpest zoom lenses I've ever tested. And I'm really impressed with it. And then, like I said, when you combine that with macro abilities and the F4, which gives you a little bit lighter weight lens, really, I haven't never seen a lens like this, really, that's like this high quality, offers telephoto zoom range and macro like that. It's like new technology, kind of, from like my perspective anyway. So I'm super impressed with this lens and I'm really happy Sony is choosing to up their game and make more lenses uh, you know, that are new and exciting. What I'm hoping for next, just as a, as a prediction here, what I wanna see next, I wanna see a version just like this, except a 100 to 500. If Sony could make a 100 to 500, just like this lens, you know, F5.6 to F7.1 or whatever will be fine, but a 100 to 500 would be awesome for like real hardcore telephoto photography. Because right now, the 200 to 600 lens is so gigantic that it's just such a burden to carry around. So I would love to see a design like this. Canon also makes one, a 100 to 500 L, that's a really nice lens. And that's kind of what I'm thinking of. And uh, I really hope Sony comes out with one of those in the future because this beast here is phenomenal. That about wraps up this review, guys. I really hope you got what you were looking for. If you can give me a thumbs up, I would really appreciate it. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, be sure to hit subscribe. In addition to that, below the video, uh, in the description area, I have a bunch of links of the gear that I use to make this video and all the stuff that pertains to this lens that I just reviewed. All right, guys, I will catch up with you next time. Take care.